A lot of things have changed over the years. Life, the internet, people, and especially food. The chefs and cooking shows that we used to watch and not to mention the chefs that I used to look up to have kind of become a part of the historical past. Their iconic recipes have been cemented in that history and now are put on a pedestal of greatness. But that makes me think, are the things we've been influenced by still as good as they were way back then? Or could they be made better? We're gonna break this down very simply. We must first make the original recipe as authentically as humanly possible, and then, based off our learnings, based off our tastings, we will do our best to make that item significantly better than it once was. So, let's begin. First up, Anthony Bourdain and his mortadella sandwich. He's easily one of the most famous chefs known to mankind. Oftentimes, by his own quote, said he was not a great chef, but I think pretty much everybody would disagree because we love him. He wasn't pretentious about food, and this sandwich was all about being unpretentious and simple. Now, you can buy a half pound or a full pound of thinly sliced mortadella, but regardless, you're gonna layer a nice mound, which could be a couple ounces, a quarter pound, however much you want per sandwich, in a mound, in a 10-inch nonstick pan, heat it over medium heat. Optionally, you can add a weight to help kind of get that mortadella nice and flat or not if you don't have one that's fine let that cook for one to two minutes or until golden brown on the bottom give it a flip add two slices of provolone reduce the heat to medium low cover with a lid for about 30 seconds or until the cheese is completely melted now remove your cheesy meaty boy place to the side and then in that same pan add a small nub of butter and look anthony bourdain suggests either a kaiser roll or a sourdough roll we actually have a little bit of both this is a kaiser sourdough roll toast on their cut sides for about one to two minutes or until they look like this now flip them over yes you can leave them in the pan it's totally fine to toast the bottom of the top it'll give it a little extra crunch and structure on the outside spread dijon mustard on the bottom bun and mayonnaise on the top bun put as little or as much as you like place the cooked mortadella onto the bottom bun top your sandwich if the sandwich cooled down at all you can cover it with the lid until warmed through by the way we will have all recipes both the og versions and my new versions on my website which is in the link in the description now let's give this sandwich some top i have nothing negative to say about this just by looking at it i mean come on supposedly this is a inspiration from brazil cheers I mean, it's kind of a perfect sandwich if you think about it. Some people might say, oh, what if you put pickles on this? This has the fattiness, the richness, the saltiness, a little cheesy, but it also cuts the richness because of that nice tart mustard in there. So really, you don't need to add anything. It's kind of good as it is. So how do you make this better? Well, we're gonna try. Since this sandwich is about being relatively low key, I tried to keep this simple while adding just a few quick things to see if we can upgrade it to what I think might be better, if that's even possible. I have one main thought here. We already have mayo and mustard, but could it be better? Maybe a Russian dressing inspired sauce? So in a small mixing bowl, add one cup or 230 grams of mayonnaise, a third cup or 80 grams of ketchup, two teaspoons or eight grams of Worcestershire sauce, half a teaspoon or two grams of sweet paprika, one tablespoon or 15 grams of Tabasco, or really any hot sauce, I don't care, two tablespoons or 30 grams of yellow mustard, one one tablespoon or four grams of very thinly sliced chives, one tablespoon or 15 grams of grated horseradish. That could be fresh, that could be jarred, but look, fresh is incomparably better. Salt and pepper to taste, whisk together until thoroughly combined, and that is your sauce. Now, similar to before, heat a 10 inch nonstick pan over medium heat. Generally speaking, for about four sandwiches, you'll need at least one and a half pounds or 680 grams of mortadella, which has been thinly sliced. Think about how much meat you want on your sandwich, put that much in the pan. Once your mortadella is in the pan, roughly in the shape of your bread, add some very thinly sliced yellow onion on top of the mortadella. Again, as much or as little as you like. Now weigh that sandwich down using another pan, a chef's press if you have them. Let that cook over medium high for two to three minutes or until a beautiful deep brown. Carefully flip, lower the heat to medium low, add two slices of provolone, cover with a lid or an inverted bowl until just melted, about one to two minutes. Remove the meat from the pan, add a small nub of butter, increase the heat to medium. Once that's totally melted, add in one slice of sourdough bread and toast for one to two minutes. Spread sauce onto the untoasted side of the bread. Add your meat on top of that. Now once toasted, transfer that to a cutting board. Add additional butter to the pan if needed and toast your other slice of bread. Again, you want that beautiful golden brown. Take it out, spread sauce on the other slice of bread. You know, maybe a little drizzle, a little sauce on the sandwich too if you're feeling extra naughty. Crown your king, cut your sandwich in half on a biased serve and enjoy. So this is like a saucier Oklahoma smash inspired Morty sandwich. But is this too much in order to beat the original? Let's taste and find out. Okay, the updated version. I didn't change that much. I tried to keep it simple. Cheers. Upon biting this, you get this crunch from the toast. You get the same salty, fatty richness from the mortadella like the last one. The onion added this sort of toasty, roasty, bring everything together flavor. It's like when you add cooked onions to a burger. It's not like you're just tasting onion. It's making a whole experience. And then the sauce, instead of it just being acidic, now there's a little bit of tart sweetness. It's a little more in depth. But that being said, is it better? I think this is better in the right context, but not necessarily better in every context. Maybe you want something simpler. It's just acid, fat, crunch. So if you're looking for a bigger experience, this is what you make, but ultimately Anthony Bourdain had it right, let's be honest. So to make our ultimate decision, we have a taste tester coming in to finalize that. Here we go, Vic. Option number one. Sandwich number two. 
We touched hands there for a second. Man, that's a tough one. They're both really good. I think I will give it to number two. Here's why. Anthony Bourdain made a great bass and it's kind of at a point where you can only mess it up from here. What was great about this version, the onions have a texture within the textured bread. Overall, it creates a good experience. Would I be mad with Anthony Bourdain's? Absolutely not. I think yeah. both of these are interchangeable and it's just a little bit extra on top of it. It's a win on the butt better scale, but really only by a slight margin. Next up, Julia Child's Coco Van. In the 1960s, Julia became America's first celebrity chef and introduced French home cooking to America. So what I'm saying is she's a beast. Anyone in the cooking and restaurant industry has an undying respect for her, as do I. And Coco Van, chicken braised in wine, is one of the most famous of her dishes. So I wanna clarify, I would have done this a lot differently, even with the same ingredients that she used, but we're gonna do it just how Julia Child did on her televised PBS segment about Coco Van. So number one, basically you boil bacon for about 10 minutes in a small saucepan, you transfer that to a five quart pot or rondo, brown over medium low, for six to eight minutes or until crisp. Then separately in a 10 inch saute pan over high heat, you add a little bit of oil, some pearl onions, cook until browned about four to six minutes. Then you're gonna cover that with water, add a knob of butter, bring to a boil, reduce to a simmer, cover with a lid and cook for 10 minutes. Yeah, I know, this is how it's done, that's how she does it. Remove the bacon from your pan, increase heat to medium high, sear all your chicken pieces three to four minutes, flip your chicken over until golden brown. And I will say, here's another thing I noticed. Normally I would season my meat before it goes in the pan, but Julia is pretty specific about seasoning her chicken with salt after it has browned. Add your bacon back to the pan, reduce the heat to low, no liquid, and cover it with a lid and cook for 10 minutes. Now in another pan, we're now using three pans at this point. Get a 10 inch saute pan over medium high, add some oil to the pan. Once it's hot, you're gonna add quartered button mushrooms, sear them for 46 minutes, tossing occasionally, and season and taste with salt once they're done. Now to finish this off, you're gonna remove the lid from your chicken, you're gonna deglaze with some cognac. Julia likes to flambe it for fun. According to her, it's not necessary. I can respect that. I like a little fun. Then you add your wine, your chicken stock should be just enough to cover. Bring that to a boil, add in some tomato paste, stir that in, a bay leaf, thyme, crushed garlic, stir that all in. Bring it to a boil, reduce heat to low, cover and cook for 15 minutes. Now we're gonna make a beurre manu, is that right? So you mix together equal parts, softened butter and flour, a little paste. Then once your chicken's done, remove your chicken from the sauce. Julia chose to strain the chicken out. I just thought it'd be easier to just pull the chicken out since it's the same concept. You're gonna add your beurre manu to the sauce in batches until it's thickened to your liking. Reduced while stirring, once it's thickened enough to coat the back of a spoon. And you're gonna add your veg back to the sauce the onions, the mushrooms, adjust your seasoning, mix together, taste one final time. This is the moment to check and see if you need more salt and pepper. And then add your chicken to a bowl, ladle your sauce and vegetables on top of the chicken and serve. Again, it turned out beautiful, but I will say the preparation of mine, I would have made a little bit more one pot and simpler and cooked the veg together. But hey, we're doing it the way Julia asked because we respect Julia. So let's taste. This is actually a childhood favorite of mine. I used to make this with my mom all the time. God, improving this is gonna be hard. It's just a perfect dish. You have everything you need in this. First off, the chicken's tender, falls off the bone, juicy, it's salty, it's rich, it's unctuous. The wine provides a woody deepness in the flavor that you don't get anywhere else. It's oniony, it's almost like the most hearty little French stew you can think of. It tastes like we're gonna have to take this way over the top to make it better, and I think I have an idea. I'm gonna make little mini chicken roasts using a Ballantine chicken leg method. And maybe if we're feeling a little naughty, we'll turn it into possibly one of the first Coco Ven poutines ever seen. Now, why would we take the time to debone the chicken? You can stuff with whatever you want. It then becomes a flavorful, miniature, personal roast. Is it a necessity? No, but does it add something? Absolutely. So you're gonna take four chicken legs with the thigh and the drumstick still attached, and you're gonna remove the bone, but leave it in one piece. If you wanna skip the deboning process, you totally can, but it kind of defeats the but better element of this. It's real simple. You take a knife and with one hand, feel where that bone is, flip your chicken over skin side down and cut along roughly where you feel the bone in a straight line all the way across the whole piece of chicken. Then using the back of your knife, scrape the meat away from the bone. You're essentially cutting the meat away from the bone while wasting as little meat as possible. Free the bone on every single side. There will be areas that are a little close to the skin. Just be careful not to remove too much meat. After a little wiggling and scraping, the bone should come out nice and easy. Now, once you get to the drumstick, it's a little bit awkward. I honestly just angle my knife just to the very edge of the drumstick and cut all the way through the skin like that to remove the leg, which will reveal a bunch of little tendons. You can run those tendons through a fork, grab them with a paper towel wrapped finger, and they should pull right out. Repeat that with all four chicken legs, and then we're gonna make a nice little herb paste. So we're gonna take three tablespoons or 12 grams of fresh sage and three tablespoons or 12 grams of fresh parsley, finely chop them together, then add that to a small bowl along with the zest of one lemon, one clove of garlic finely chopped, one tablespoon or 15 grams of Dijon mustard, one tablespoon or 15 grams of extra virgin 
olive oil, a little bit of salt and pepper to taste, mix together, and you should have a nice light paste. Now lay your deboned chicken legs out, meat side facing up, evenly split your herb paste between all of those, season a taste of salt and pepper, roll those up into doit logs, and tie at three intervals using butcher's twine. I mean, you can literally just tie it like a shoe, or you could just tie a knot. We just need this to stay closed. Now season your roast with salt. Heat a large five-quart pot or Dutch oven over medium-high heat. Add just enough vegetable oil on the bottom to coat the pan, and sear your chicken on all sides about two to three minutes per side until the skin is golden brown. Remove the chicken from the pan, reduce the heat to medium, and add two ounces or 56 grams of diced guan chale or bacon. Cook until the fat's rendered and it's brown, about three to four minutes. Follow that with 20 pearl onions, depending on their size. If they're huge, maybe cut that in half. Three shallots quartered, and four cloves of finely chopped garlic. Season that lightly with salt, add two tablespoons or 30 grams of tomato paste, and cook until the tomato paste deepens in color, 30 to 45 seconds. Deglaze that with a quarter cup or 60 grams of bourbon, and reduce until all the liquid is gone. Follow that with three tablespoons or 45 grams of unsalted butter. Once that's fully melted, add three tablespoons or 30 grams of all-purpose flour. Cook for about one minute, stirring occasionally. Then add two cups or 480 milliliters of red wine, two cups or 480 milliliters of chicken stock, season lightly with salt, one tablespoon or 15 grams of molasses, two tablespoons or 30 grams of red wine vinegar. Now I will say both of these ingredients were mixed together, hence why the molasses looks sort of liquidy because it's the molasses and the red wine vinegar mixed together. This is not a necessity for the recipe, we just did it to save an extra dish from cleaning. And three carrots cut into one inch chunks. Increase the heat to medium high, bring to a boil, and then reduce the heat to low to bring it to a nice gentle simmer. Add your chicken roast back to the pot, followed with four ounces or 113 grams of maitake mushrooms broken up into bite-sized clusters. And four ounces or 113 grams of shiitake mushrooms that have been halved or quartered, depending on their size. Woo, we're almost done here, brother. All right, stay with me. Add in four sprigs of fresh thyme. Pop on your lid and braise for 20 to 30 minutes. Once this thing is done, of course you can serve it just as is with mashed potatoes or rice or whatever. But we have to go above and beyond in this, all right? So I fried up one pound or 450 grams of French fries at 350 Fahrenheit in a six-quart Dutch oven filled just over halfway with vegetable oil. After that, I pulled my fries out, popped them into a bowl, season them generously with salt, transfer that to a serving bowl, top with a few cheese curds, you know, for the poutine vibes. Lift off the lid from this beautiful braised chicken and you're left with that same luxurious silky sauce, but instead this time you have boneless stuffed chicken roasts sitting in that deeply flavored juice. So spoon some of that sauce and veg onto your french fries, slice one of your Ballantine roasts, lay out the chicken on the fries, drizzle with some additional sauce, and now we taste. That is insane. This is a perfect dish right here. This is 100% elevated and better than this. Listen, I know Vikram is not blindfolded. Simple reality is the second a french fry goes into his mouth, he's gonna know which one is which. The bar is here. Right, let's see this one. That's insane. What I like about this one is the traditional flavor of it. It's just great on its own. Now, what was improved here, the stuffing. Without the poutine aspect even in play, I think this is better, but adding in the fries, adding in the cheese curds, it's just a textural wonderland that improves upon traditionality. And so I'm gonna have to give it to the poutine, but I could eat both of these anytime, and it's just a matter of how much effort you wanna put into it. So french fries aside, this seems like a pretty clear win. An incredible original dish. Moving on to Ina Garten's chocolate cake. My wife loves Ina Garten aka the Barefoot Contessa. She's a TV food legend. I gotta say, I love Ina Garten. She's so sweet. One of her most famous recipes is called Beatty's Chocolate Cake. Beatty? Is that true? Is that correct? Beatty? Beatty? I don't know. It's spelled like this, which supposedly is one of the internet's most favorite cake recipes of all time, especially for how easy it is. The spark notes is essentially dry ingredients like flour, cocoa powder, sugar, baking soda, baking powder, and salt get all mixed together, and then in a separate bowl, you beat together eggs, buttermilk, vanilla extract, and vegetable oil. Those ingredients get mixed together on a stand mixer until you get a nice looking cake batter, which you then add add brewed coffee to that, which turns it into a surprisingly thin batter that gets evenly distributed between two greased, floured, and parchment paper two by eight inch cake pans, baked until cooked through, and separately, a simple chocolate frosting of whipped butter, egg yolk, vanilla extract, of course, confectioner sugar, melted chocolate, and hydrated instant coffee that gets blended. It looks nice. The only thing that was funny is once the cakes were cooled, I started spreading on the frosting and I realized, uh-oh, I don't know if we have enough frosting. And sure enough, well, we actually didn't. We ran out of frosting before I finished frosting the cake. Look, if there's anyone here that gets it, I get it. Writing recipes when they're being written in the hundreds or thousands can be very hard to keep consistent, especially when it's handed off to writers that maybe don't know your style. So, Ina, we love you. We get it. The cake looks soft, but is it moist? I like it. It's a decent tasting cake. Number one, it is very moist, which that is already going to be a big point for me. But the flavor is just not balanced. It feels very muted. It's very coffee forward. I don't pick up any of the vanilla. And by that, I mean maybe a little more sugar, but more specifically, there is not enough salt in the frosting or the cake. This is a key element of great baking, not just cakes, baking anything, bread, pastries, pies. I don't care. You must add enough salt. That is key to making anything great. So I think I have an idea on how we can make this better. Now, remember, 
moving on to my version. To start with, I'm only gonna make some slight changes here. Now for this recipe, I'm a big believer in small changes for big results. And one of those is gonna be the frosting, that's for sure. First, start with the cakes. By sifting into a stand mixer bowl, one and three quarters of a cup or 245 grams of all-purpose flour. Two cups or 300 grams of granulated sugar. Three quarters of a cup or 75 grams of cocoa powder. Two teaspoons or eight grams of baking powder. One teaspoon or four grams of baking soda. One and a half teaspoons or six grams of fine sea salt. It's very important, fine sea salt, not kosher. Whisk that together. Then in a separate bowl, you're gonna add two eggs. Whisk those eggs together and then whisk in half a cup or 120 milliliters of vegetable oil. Two teaspoons or eight grams of vanilla extract. One cup or 240 milliliters of buttermilk. Now add the wets to the dries in the stand mixer. Mix until homogenous on medium speed using the paddle attachment. Once that's combined, add one cup or 240 milliliters of brewed coffee, which has been cooled to room temperature, to the batter and mix until just combined. Again, we have two greased floured two by eight inch cake pans that also have parchment cut out in the bottom. And you're gonna split your batter evenly between the two. Pop those into an oven set to 350 Fahrenheit or 176 Celsius. Use a cake tester, poke it in the center. If that comes out clean, it's done. Now let those cakes cool for 30 minutes or until completely cool. Do not frost a cake that is still warm. You will regret it. And then you're gonna comment and go, well, it didn't, the frosting didn't work. I only let it cool for five minutes, but for some reason that Yeah, for some reason, huh? Maybe because you didn't listen. Now upgrade number one, which is less of an upgrade and more of a fix. I'm increasing the batch size of the frosting. Now to make the frosting add 12 ounces or 340 grams of chopped semi-sweet chocolate to a double boiler, which is literally just a bowl set on top of a pot filled with a shallow amount of water at a light simmer. Let that heat stirring occasionally. And once it's fully melted, take it off and let it sit for five to 10 minutes. Once it's sat in a large bowl, add one pound or 450 grams of softened unsalted butter. There is no skipping the softening process. Real sorry. Use electric beaters to whip the butter until pale and creamy. Now into upgrade number two, add half a cup or 120 grams of softened cream cheese. Look, I just like cream cheese and frosting. I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes recipe writing is very simple. I put this in there because it tastes yummy. Is that okay? Beat that together until homogenous. And finally, upgrade number three, add one teaspoon or four grams of fine sea salt. Listen, this needed more salt. I'm telling you, I know I have a salt heavy palate, but the greatest desserts that we've ever had oftentimes have way more salt than you would think to not only help bring out the sweetness, but bring out the natural flavors that are already in the dish that should be there, aka chocolate, aka coffee, so on and so forth. Now, one tablespoon or 15 grams of vanilla extract, then beat in three cups or 330 grams of confectioner sugar, beat in your melted chocolate, make sure to beat it in gently, otherwise it'll break. And finally, one tablespoon or 15 grams of instant coffee granules, which have been dissolved by adding two teaspoons or eight grams of very hot water and stirred combined. That should cool it down just enough to add, just make sure it's not boiling hot when you pour it in. Mix until combined and you have your frosting. Now remove your cakes from the cake pan, spread a layer of frosting on top of the first cake, add your second cake and frost the entire cake. You know, if you rewind to earlier when I plopped this first little bit of frosting in the center, yeah, that was a bad idea. I did that a little too hard and it kind of concaved a cake, a whittle. So it might be a little weird shape when we cut it. So we cut and uh, okay, yeah, you can see where I threw that down. That's fine. Now we're gonna serve and see if my changes made it better. The tale of two cakes. Listen, Ina, you're a legend, a scholar, and a beast. And I love you. That being said, I thought this cake was actually really nice. It was one of the better, more moist cakes that I've made, but there were some small details that I tried to improve on. Let me preface by saying I don't like making cakes. It is quite literally the one thing that I just have not enjoyed and have always kind of had a hard time making good. That being said, let's taste. It's not that different of a cake. It's not. It's just a little bit more refined in terms of it's got the salt that I want and it's got the chocolatiness that I want. That being said, both delectable cakes. This one I would say is slightly improved, but the only person that can answer that is our taste tester. You ready? I'm so ready. I love cake. I don't like coffee. Oh, sh forgot Vikram doesn't like coffee. All right, number one. Yeah, I'd say the coffee is only about like 10% of the flavor here. Number two. I'm gonna give it slightly to number two. What I like about the second one more is there definitely is a bit more salt. For some reason, it's just creamier. Just overall, a nicer bite, a nicer experience for me on the second one. That is another win for us in the bucket. A slight win. All of these are all slight wins. But can we maybe... Uh, okay, you're sucking on that way too much, dude, all right? These are all slight wins. I want a big win. So we're moving on to the Jean George caviar egg. Jean George is one of the most globally famous chefs in modern history. Somehow I beat him in a cooking challenge at his own restaurant. Frankly, I think he was just gracious enough to let me win. I would say that his caviar egg is probably one of the most iconically known OG fine dining dishes that I can think of. He has a savory whipped cream, which is made with heavy cream whisked together with some cayenne vodka and lemon juice. Then we have four eggs, which will be soft scrambled in a pan. I'm not gonna change the way that I make my soft scramble, so I'll explain to you how they're made in my but better recipe. So he makes a quick soft scramble, which is then spooned into an empty cleaned eggshell. Yes, that's right. You gotta take an eggshell and take off the top. You can use one of these tools or you can use a 
very sharp small knife. Pipe your savory cream around the edge of your eggshell, leaving a little open nest in the center. What's gonna go there? Oh, maybe one of Chef JG's favorite things of all time, a big fat dollop of caviar. This thing just makes me wanna give someone a little kiss. It's like a creamy suede-like dream. It's salty, it's fatty, it's rich, it's smooth and silky. It's a very rich, rich, rich bite, but that's kind of where it stops. I feel like I want more to the texture of it all, but that being said, it is so unique and so good. I do like it, but I know we can make this a little bit more to my taste and quite possibly better. Now, what are the changes that I make? I'm adding a few things to give it some extra textural depth. Surprise, surprise, the guy that wrote the book Texture Over Taste wants more texture. Now here we're using my duck confit hash browns. This time we just shaped our hash browns into little three inch patties using a ring mold, which were then frozen overnight. We then began the rest of the process, which I took half a pound of bacon that I cut into half inch thick lardones that were cooked on medium low heat in a small pan until just golden brown, which were then drained and set to the side. Instead of the whipped cream, I'm gonna make a light citrus creme fraiche. So we got half a cup or 120 grams of creme fraiche into a small bowl, the zest and juice of one lemon, seasoned with salt and pepper, one tablespoon or four grams of chopped fresh parsley, one tablespoon or four grams of chopped fresh dill. Stir that together until thoroughly combined and that is your citrus creme fresh. Leave that in the fridge because we want it as stiff as possible. Let's briefly walk through the soft scrambled egg. It's real simple. Melt one tablespoon or 15 grams of unsalted butter in a non-stick 10 inch pan set over medium heat. Once it's half melted, you're going to add three to four eggs depending on their size. Ideally, you would want to have a silicone whisk for this. You can constantly whisk and stir while that's cooking. But if you don't, a rubber heat proof spatula works as well. So you're going to cook that over medium heat, constantly stirring. Do not stop. Treat it like a risotto. As you see curds start to form, take it off the heat. Continue stirring, stirring, stirring. Back on the heat. It'll form some more curds. Take it off the heat. Stir, stir, stir. Just keep on stirring and repeating this process for anywhere between four to six minutes until you're left with a velvety smooth, small curd, soft scramble like this. The texture should be relatively runny, but not raw. Cut off the heat, fold in two teaspoons or 10 grams of cold butter into the egg until melted and emulsified and set that to the side. Don't forget to season and taste with salt at the end. There should be enough eggs to cover two to three hash browns. So if you're serving maybe four or six people, you may want to double the amount of eggs. Fry one potato patty in duck fat or vegetable oil set to 350 Fahrenheit or 175 Celsius and fry until GBD. Golden brown, delicious about two to three minutes. Remove your hash brown, drain, lightly season with salt, then pop your hash brown onto a plate, followed by a nice generous quenelle of your soft scrambled egg. A few of your big boy crispy lardones, a generous spoonful of your creme fraiche on top of the eggs, seasoned lightly with fresh cracked black pepper, some thinly sliced chives, and finally a big fat juicy dollop of the finest caviar you can find. Is this insane? Is this overly luxurious? Yes, it is. My inspiration behind this is a full breakfast. You got eggs, hash browns, bacon. What more do you need? A little caviar, a little creme fraiche to bring in the Jean Georges. This is equally, if not more decadent than this, but you got some more structure from the crunch of the hash brown. It's crispy, it's soft. The bacon provides a salty little bit of chewiness, but then that all melds together into a creamy symphony of soft scrambled egg, refreshing creme fraiche, and then the ba ba of the caviar. A very modern interpretation versus a much older take with a different perspective. It's an unfair competition because this doesn't have a duck fat confit hash brown with it, so obviously I think this is better, but we have a judge to determine that. Vikram doesn't like caviar, so I'm doing this tasting. God damn. This is so one note. The flavor's maximized on it, but to eat it, it's all the same. And then you eat this thing, and it's like the greatest breakfast you've ever had in a few bites. It's so well balanced. But then you get these like pops of acidity from the sour cream with the lemon juice and the lemon zest, the smokiness from the bacon, that little bit of onion from the chives. This one's a million times better. So we win another round. Four absolute Goliaths, a couple massive wins, a couple small wins. I'm happy with it, but we don't finish here. We have one remaining Goliath to complete this, and that is the one and only Mr. Gordon Ramsay. Sweetheart, I'm coming for you. <laughs> Finally, the big one, Gordon Ramsay's Beef Wellington. Contrary to popular belief, Gordon Ramsay did not invent the dish. Neither did Julia Child, but she was the first modern TV chef to popularize it in the 1960s. And he absolutely perfected the recipe. So Gordon's original recipe is pretty simple, right? We've all seen it. You got the perfect midsection of the filet mignon, cut into a small roast, it gets seared, brushed with mustard, you make a little duxelle. He actually skips the crepe process. He just straight up wraps his beef in the prosciutto and duxelle, which then goes into puff pastry, wrapped, brushed, and baked. That's kind of it. Now it's time for a taste test. Okay, and I know what this tastes like, but just to refresh my memory. It's a classic Wellington. It's delicious. It's mushroomy. It's meaty. It's beefy. It's buttery. It's crispy on the outside, soft and juicy. It's a pleasure pure of flavor. 
That being said, it's an old recipe. I think we can beat it. What are the changes I made? Well, for one, we're definitely adding the crepe. So we're gonna make a greens crepe, which we'll be using spinach as our green. But how do we upgrade this? For one, the mushrooms in the Dixel, instead of just being boring old button mushrooms, we're gonna use the most flavorful, my most favorite mushrooms ever, black trumpet mushrooms. Let's be honest, the lowest flavor of beef you can get, which is a filet mignon, a tenderloin, we're instead gonna be doing a 48 hour cooked short rib. Am I going way over the top? Of course I am. So you're gonna need two pounds or 900 grams of short ribs ideally would be to get a whole short rib plate which was then cut into individual long boy dino ribs but if you only have the cut up ones then you could just make small mini beef wellingtons now season this with salt and pepper vacuum seal in a bag and cook at 69 celsius nice in a sous vide circulator bath for 48 hours once those are done cool in the fridge overnight trim the meat from the bone and lightly trim it into a rectangular shape see that on all sides over medium high heat in a non-stick pan i know you're not supposed to use higher heat on a non-stick pan i don't really care i'm telling you this thing will stick to just about anything. It's way easier to do it on stick. At that point, I'll take it out, brush it with two tablespoons or 30 grams of spicy mustard and cool for 20 to 30 minutes. Now for the crepe batter, into a blender, add one cup or 140 grams of all-purpose flour, one and a half cups or 350 milliliters of whole milk, four eggs, blend on high until combined, and then two cups or 90 grams of fresh spinach. Blend that on high until pureed, pass through a chinois, and that is your crepe batter. Now in a 10-inch non-stick pan over medium heat, lightly greased with cooking spray. Once hot, add a two ounce ladle full of batter, swirl to coat and cook for 30 to 45 seconds flip and cook for another 30 to 45 seconds repeat that until you have about four crepes that's enough for two wellingtons to make the duxelle into a food processor add four ounces or 113 grams of black trumpet mushrooms four ounces or 113 grams of shiitake mushrooms and four ounces or 113 grams of maitake mushrooms blitz until very finely chopped add a tablespoon or 15 grams of unsalted butter then heat a five quart pot over medium high heat let that melt and then add one finely diced shallot season lightly with salt and saute until just translucent, about one to two minutes. Add your mushrooms, one sprig of rosemary, and let that cook until the mushrooms are fully cooked through and there's no water remaining, about three to four minutes, stirring occasionally. Then deglaze with a quarter cup or 60 grams of bourbon. Be careful because it will ignite from the flame below if you have high heat. Please be careful. Now cook that until no liquid remains whatsoever. Cut off the heat, add in four cloves of finely chopped garlic, and grate one ounce or 28 grams of black truffle into the duck cell. Now that's optional, but hey, I'm flexing here, all right? I'm flexing. Transfer that to a bowl and fold in two tablespoons or 30 grams of miso. Now, here's how we shape this bad boy up. You're gonna put two green crepes on plastic wrap. Line up four to six slices of prosciutto. Evenly spread your duxel over the prosciutto into a square. Place your short rib at the base of those layers. This should be long and wide enough, just enough to completely cover your short rib edge to edge. Roll that up, holding the end shut, and roll up nice and tight until you get a round sausage like this. Rest that for 15 to 20 minutes in the fridge. Then roll out a nice large piece of puff pastry. Take out your short rib package. Place it at the base of your puff pastry and roll that up and just until you meet both ends lightly brush your puff pastry with egg wash so it sticks roll it over press to it here now wrap that in plastic wrap nice and thoit and rest in the fridge for 10 to 15 minutes so once your pastry has rested brush that with an egg wash consisting of two egg yolks and a light splash of water optionally if you want to add a lattice crust it's just literally additional puff pastry that's been rolled out cut with a lattice cutter and then draped over the top you will need to brush that again with egg wash so that the lattice is also egg washed add a generous sprinkling of flaky salt on top and bake in an oven set to 400 degrees Fahrenheit or 205 degrees Celsius for 20 to 25 minutes or until a beautiful GBD on the outside and the internal temperature is, well, it just needs to be honestly hot. Now we cut into that to reveal one of the most juiciest, fattiest, luxurious interiors I've ever seen to a beef wellington. Of course, it's lightly pink from a little bit of a cure that occurs during the sous vide process. Obviously, it's not medium rare because it's been cooked for 48 hours, but that doesn't matter because it's short rib and it's not about medium rare it's about fall apart tender juicy meat in your mouth encased in crispy buttery puff pastry this is luxury right here but is it actually better let's taste and find out this is a big step up just visually. I did check it. It does kind of look like there's some white fat, but it's just really well marbled. And it's lightly cured, please. Look at this, dude. When I cut into this, my first thought was, this does look delicious. I know it will taste good, but I'm worried that it will be too rich. Or only one bite and you're done. If I wasn't on a diet, I would eat this whole god dang thing. So I would call it a winner, but we need a taste tester to determine a true win. Woo, Vikram's back. Yeah, Vikram loves beef fart.
That's insane. That's an easy win for the second one. It's not even close. That is so much more tender. It's every good part about a Wellington. Every single layer of it is better. It starts and ends with the beef in the middle. The short rib is insane. It's a great application in a Wellington. Would I ever do this? I don't think I'd even make a normal Wellington, but I'm glad I got to experience that. Vicar made an important point here. All of these things weren't exactly the most practical, but they were better. And this feels a lot less practical than say this. And so I guess what I would say to you is if you're gonna take the time to wrap the Wellington and wait for it overnight and all those different things, then you might as well just go the extra step and just plop a short rib into a sous vide circulator for 48 hours to experience a truly upgraded beef wellington. So what did we learn? Well, I'll tell you what I learned is that all of these recipes were great in their own right, considering how long ago they may or may not have been made. They were the perfect jumping off point for me to make them better. What was great can always be made greater. And that's what this is about. Goodbye, I love you, big kiss, mwah.